see the rest of you. And I want to thank you for um, being with me today at lunchtime um, to talk about a topic that um, is uh, sometimes hard to talk about. Grief is heavy and hard. So I appreciate you being willing to come and participate. Um, I want to... Brooke, I can't make my slides move for some reason. That's strange. Maybe it has to do with the poll. Oh, there we go. Okay. Oh, you got Good. it. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. Do you want me to leave the poll up or put it down? No, it's down on mine. Is it down on yours? Oh. Yeah. Oh. Angela, Did anyone screen? see the results? It showed the results. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks. It's always good to have a couple of glitches right at the start. Those are the <laughs> only ones we're going to have. It's good we got those out of the way. Um, so looking at the results of the poll, um, it looks like many of us are currently experiencing anticipatory grief, um, and some of us are aware that we have experienced it in the past. Uh, and I want to just acknowledge before we start that we've all experienced loss during the past year. It's been a challenging time for all of us. We've been asked to adapt to things. We have um, given up things. We've had things taken from us. We've certainly had to learn new things over these last many months. Um, so as we start today and we move into the topic of anticipatory grief, I want to just light a candle in honor of all the loss that we have all encountered um, over the past year. I'm going to start with um, a couple of definitions that I think will just sort of set the, the stage for our um, topic today. And I want to just say that I'm talking today um, based on things that I've learned, of course, over my time at Lumina and my time in working with people who are experiencing grief um, and loss. Um, but I'm also presenting today just as a fellow human, as someone who is currently experiencing anticipatory grief. Um, so I, I hope that that part um, of my humanity comes through in the presentation today, that um, I certainly know some things about this topic um, from um, my work experience, but also from my personal experience. So when we talk about grief in general, I think we tend to think of a reaction that we have after a death. Um, but really, when we define grief, we say it's any reaction to a loss, um, not just sorrow and sadness, but any natural instinctual reaction that we might experience um, in the wake of a loss. When we talk about mourning, we're talking about the outward expression of these natural instinctual reactions. When we grieve something, we um, are reacting to a loss. When we feel sorrow, when we feel fatigue, when we feel fuzzy headed, those are not things that we choose to feel. Those are just, as it says, natural reactions to a loss. Mourning is the choice that we make. It's the way that we move those natural reactions up and out of our body. And it's an important distinction to make um, because mourning is the way that we think our grief reactions get softer over time. So being intentional about how we move the grief up and out of our body helps us over time make the grief feel softer and lighter to carry. So let's talk for just a minute about what we know is happening when we are experiencing grief. What we know is that a fight or flight response gets activated um, when we experience grief reactions. And that feels very much in our body like a stress reaction. Fight or flight means that all of our systems 
become activated. Our muscles become tight so that we can jump out of the way of a predator. Um, our eyesight becomes um, exaggerated. Our hearing becomes much more um, amplified. Um, our stomach churns in a rapid way. Our brain is racing. We really get pushed in fight or flight into a very hypervigilant state. We are sensing that danger is imminent. And so we are in sort of a state of scanning our environment for the next um, bad thing to come. And it requires a great deal of energy on our part. As a result, what we know about grief reactions is that while we tend to think of them as emotional reactions, actually grief impacts us in the five areas that you see listed on your screen. Cognitively, spiritually, emotionally, physically, and socially, we feel the impact of the grief. So while we tend to think of grief as just sorrow, what you'll see through the presentation today is that all types of grief, including anticipatory grief, can impact us in lots of ways. So what is anticipatory grief? Well, you'll see on the screen some kind of wordy, complicated definitions, um, I think. But a very simple way to describe it is um, an anticip anticipating an impending loss. So a response to an awareness that a loss is coming. So often that is as a result of something life-threatening or a diagnosis that's terminal. Um, we have a reaction and a, and a recognition that we have loss that is looming. We also use the phrase anticipatory grief to talk about any grief that we might experience before the death. So we're really talking about two different things here, an awareness of impending losses in the future, as well as experiencing loss that are leading up to um, a loss that we encounter at the time of death. Actually, Therese Rando, who's one of the um, first grief and loss researchers who talked about anticipatory grief, now says that she doesn't like this term, anticipatory grief because it indicates that we are grieving about something that's a future event. But in reality, when we talk about anticipatory grief, we're talking about all the losses that we are grieving um, as we lead up to uh, a death or an ending, including past, present, and future losses. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. So who might be impacted by anticipatory grief? Well, we know that if we use the example of, of a family, when someone receives a terminal diagnosis, we would expect family members, friends, caregivers, people who are supporting the terminally ill person to be experiencing anticipatory grief as they become aware of the amount of time they have left with their person. We also recognize that the patient who receives a terminal diagnosis would also be experiencing anticipatory grief, a realization of the losses that they are now going to experience, and a real expectation and knowledge and awareness of the time they have left with their family and friends. So who is impacted? Caregivers, friends, neighbors, family members, the patient themselves. Um, often we hear about anticipatory grief as it, as it pertains to someone with a terminal diagnosis. We also use the phrase often when we talk about families who have um, someone within their family structure who is experiencing Alzheimer's or any kind of dementia. I want to also posit that over the last year, I think all of us have been experiencing anticipatory grief. We've had a year, as I mentioned earlier, with a lot of loss associated with it and a very keen awareness of the fragility of life. 
not only have we experienced losses throughout this year as things and meaningful activities have been taken from us, but um, we have uh, witnessed and read about and been very aware of an increased um, death rate and a real sense that um, our own safety and security is at risk and, and those around us are also at risk. So if you came to the presentation thinking, maybe I haven't experienced anticipatory grief before, um, I, I want you to come away with some awareness, I hope, of perhaps um, that you have also been experiencing the losses um, over this past year. Recently, um, I spoke with someone who was sharing with me that she is an only child. She has, um, you know, elderly parents who are relatively healthy at this point, but as they continue to age, her own awareness of um, uh, anxiety around their decline and what her life will be like after their death um, is something that she has been experiencing, a feeling that one day I will lose them and that that's causing some in intense anxiety for her. And it was actually helpful for her to be able to name that as anticipatory grief, a real awareness that um, she may not have much more time uh, with her parents. What might we be grieving before the death of someone as we have an awareness of a terminal illness or as we have an awareness that someone is aging or as we ourselves might be experiencing an illness or our own decline? Well, certainly we would be experiencing um, some physical loss, loss of, loss of body control, loss of mobility, um, loss of hopes and dreams, um, planning for the future. In the present, we might be experiencing the loss of someone's employment, of their finances, um, a loss of independence and control, certainly for the patient and also for the caregiver, a loss of freedom, ability to you know, do what you want to do, a loss of sense of your own you know, time, Loss of role in the family, those often get shifted around when someone has a terminal diagnosis or when someone is providing care. Loss of love and affection, intimacy, loss of stability and security, a loss of a shared past, someone who knows your inside jokes with you perhaps, or someone who can fill in the gaps in a story you're telling about something that happened in the past. Uh, loss of partnership. Uh, so I like the definition to think of when we think of what we are grieving, to think about we might be grieving the past. We are grieving the loss of the person that we once knew, even if the person is with us. Their abilities are declining and changing. So we're grieving a loss of the past. We might be grieving the loss of the present. In this present moment, my person is not who I know them to be. And we might be grieving for things yet to come, grieving the future. This is not, you know, we're not going to be able to do the things we thought we were going to be able to do. So grieving in three realms all at the same time is incredibly difficult. I'm going to give you just a minute, and I'm hoping that through the chat, you might be able to add, if you can think of other losses that you might um, add to this list, I'd like to um, hear from you if there are other losses that you can name that you have experienced um, before the death of someone um, that we can sort of fill in to this. Does anyone have something they want to add? There, I will, and, and, and Brooke, maybe you can help me see if any, any others come in, but I will say in my own experience with my mom who um, has dementia, um, the communication piece has been, um, has felt like a big loss to me that, you know, this person that I used to tell stories to and receive great support from is really no longer able to um, listen to my 
uh, sometimes lengthy stories and provide feedback in the way that um, I valued so much. Melissa, we do have a couple um, comments in the chat. Okay. You want me to read them to you? Yeah, that'd be great, Brooke. Um, we have competence, mm -hmm. fear of loss of self, loss or flip of parent-child relationship. Mm. Um, husband has dementia and daily I grieve the losses of his awareness of family and friends, of time, place, person. Grieving that my mom wouldn't be around to be a grandma to her long-awaited grandkids, mm. loss of personal dignity. Um, loss of humor. So I've got quite yes, a few to thank add. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I am with you and feeling all of those things. I think those are really, really good, good insights there. And, and particularly I'm struck by the loss of self that we in this role of caregiving are, are, you know, giving so much of ourself and um, that and just the physical labor that that requires on top of giving up lots of the things that perhaps were meaningful to us as this job requires more and more of our time and attention. Um, I think this is important to look at this list and to and to realize that that it is certainly not all inclusive that we could continue to add to this. Um, and we'll come back to the importance of this list um, later in the PowerPoint when we talk about uh, what helps. I, I really appreciate getting your input on that and hearing from you all about um, the losses that you were experiencing. So these losses, this list that we can come up with, how do they impact us? What does our anticipatory grief look like and feel like? Obviously, grief often feels like very heavy sadness and sorrow. Um, some things that we might not quickly connect to grief, but that very much are, would be um, a lack of patience, um, a short temper. Um, as I said earlier, you know, grief often feels like stress. So, we have that sort of hyper hypervigilance reaction uh, that we talked about with fight or flight. Often people in grief feel immense fatigue. It is incredibly tiring to be in grief. Just a, a general kind of sense of lethargy, um, lack of energy, lack of motivation. Um, feeling very easily overwhelmed and difficulty with making decisions. I can think of times when people have said to me in their caregiving role, you know, I, I cannot make a decision. I can't decide what to make for lunch. I can't figure out what clothes to put on my body. Even those, those relatively smaller decisions often become really overwhelming for people. Um, the, this list that you're looking at on the screen are all things that would be normal to feel um, at any time in your grief, whether you're experiencing anticipatory grief or grief after a death. There are a couple of things that are more unique about reactions we might experience in anticipatory grief. Anticipatory grief tends to have more anger connected with it. Um, and anger, of course, is a, is an uncomfortable feeling for most of us. It's not something that we, um, typically welcome to feel. The thinking in, in anticipatory grief is that there's such a lack of, of control, a sense that you're not in control, that things are really happening all around you and that you're often just trying to catch up, um, and that that contributes often to a real sense of anger and frustration. Another very common reaction, grief reaction that people feel is this withdrawing socially, feeling incredibly lonely, um, wanting to have support and friends around and at the same time not wanting that. Um, desperately yearning for it and then getting a little taste of it and thinking, 
you, you, you know, this group doesn't feel good or these people aren't getting where I'm coming from. Um, another one that is common in anticipatory grief that is not listed on your screen is a rehearsing of the death, ruminating or visualizing what the death will be like, thinking um, intensely about what I will feel like when the death occurs. Um, and I just want to, you know, say that that's a very normal part of anticipatory grief to sort of find your mind racing ahead, almost as if you're trying to prepare for this looming event. Often people describe anticipatory grief as feeling like they're on a roller coaster. Lots of emotions um, all over the map, shifting um, between, you know, real sense of gratitude for time that is left mixed with very heavy feelings of dread and anxiety um, and sorrow. Uh, so we can get a real mix of feelings. Um, we can be all over the map. We can certainly have many days in an, in this time of anticipatory grief where we don't think we're feeling any grief at all. Uh, we have this ability to kind of put the grief in a box and put it up on the shelf during anticipatory grief because we have to tend to other things. And that's a real valuable skill I think that we have, that we can, that we can put the grief on the back burner for periods of time while we have to focus on um, you know, tasks that are in front of us. Um, Brooke, are there other things people want want to say about this page at all? I just don't want to ignore. Yeah, that's okay. okay. Um, yes, we have um, agreement. I'm exhausted. I can't sleep. Mm -hmm. um, I feel sorrow, overwhelmed, anxiety, mm -hmm. uh, stress, stress eating. Mm -hmm. um, Yep, I spend hours and days putting out brush fires caused by his words, actions. Mm. Um, someone suggests trying meditation apps as well. Oh, nice. That's a good thought. Yeah, I, I, I want to say, you know, briefly um, about the hypervigilance and the awareness that fight or flight is activated. So your body is working so hard to sort of keep you in this elevated, protected place. And we are so tired because we're trying to keep that fight or flight activated over a long period, often for people in a, in a caregiving role, that can be years of living in that hypervigilant place. At the end of the day, when we are so fatigued and we want to lie down, what we want our body to do is to turn off the fight or flight, to go to a fully relaxed, vulnerable place. And everything internally in your body is saying, don't do that. Don't let down your guard. Don't become, um, you know, vulnerable. And so although we feel very exhausted and fatigued, what we ask our bodies to do at the end of the day um, is often <laughs> not something that, that the system wants to comply with. Uh, and that makes it really hard to get a lot of sleep. Um, okay, so let's think for just, I want to move ahead to thinking and acknowledging um, what makes it hard to feel our anticipatory grief. Um, we're busy, as someone so eloquently said in the chat, we're, we're busy putting out brush fires. We're busy tending to the tasks that, that are immediately in front of us. And often those tasks are um, truly life or death. We're working very hard to keep someone alive. And so to shift out of that present focus and, and focus on ourselves and our own emotional reactions and experiences is incredibly hard to do. We may feel guilty about focusing on ourselves. Uh, we may feel a real um, intense desire to present as strong rather than being, you know, needy, sorrowful, weak, all of those kinds of negative things that we tend to associate with, a, you know, with the grief experience. 
um, that it feels very often very important as the caregiver that we be the strongest person in the room, right? The person who can handle all the things that are coming at us. The other one that I hear frequently from people is, yes, I'm aware that I'm experiencing loss and I'm feeling grief, but I am afraid that if I move towards that grief and I even just open the door a tiny bit to the grief that's there, I'm going to kind of get the full tidal wave of grief and loss and I may lose control or not be able to pull myself back together and get back to the brush fires that are in front of me. Um, people also say, you know, it's not my time. The focus should be on the person who is sick right now. And um, it feels um, almost shameful or selfish to focus on myself in any way. I still get to be, you know, in the world and this person is uh, wrapping up their time in the world. So the focus should be on them. Um, also, I think there's a pressure to be in the moment. You know, we, we don't want to be sad and sorrowful when our person is in front of us and only has X amount of time left. We want to be in a state of gratefulness and joyfulness and soaking up the time that we have left. And there's a feeling that the grief doesn't really coexist well with a, with a, with a presence and a state of gratitude. Also, I think you all kind of alluded to this in your chat, but, but there also is just a sense that I really don't have the time or the energy to focus on my grief. Um, I have a minimal amount of energy that I can give each day, and I want to give it towards my person. Um, and if I, if I don't, if I start to pay attention to my own grief reactions, um, I don't know that I will be able to give to my person in the same way. I also want to acknowledge, um, and I didn't put this on the slide, but anticipatory grief doesn't necessarily have an ending. We don't know when the ending of this is coming. And so I think you know, we may acknowledge that we're grieving in some way, but we also have a sense that this caregiving situation might go on for six more months, six more years, a decade or more. And so we, there's almost this internal sense of I need to pace myself on how much I can actually let myself feel um, right now, because I may be feeling this for quite some time. And that is a very distinct difference between this kind of grief and the grief that we feel after a death when there is a, you know, a definitive ending there um, uh, that we're working with. Um, someone recently talked to me about their anticipatory grief. And one of the things she said was that there was this sense for her that um, she was grieving and that she was grieving while she was caregiving, but it felt almost daily like she had to make a choice between feeling hopeful or shifting towards her grief and that she didn't know how to hold both of those things at the same time. So each day it felt like either a hopeful day or a grieving day and that there was also a sense of guilt on the days that she let the grief be present because what that meant was in some ways that she was admitting defeat in her words. Um, and she really wanted to remain hopeful for her person who was sick. Um, I also heard from someone um, recently who said to me, my motivation for providing care and not thinking about my own sadness is I want to care for my husband in the same way that he cared for me for the last 40 years. And um, I can't think about myself right now. I need to only think about him. Uh, so there are a lot of barriers to allowing ourselves to feel the impact um, of the anticipatory grief. Let's shift a little bit and just think about what some of the benefits of anticipatory grief might be. 
Um, and I want to acknowledge this, is, this requires a little bit of a shift in thinking, right? For, for many of us, we tend to think about grief as something we want to avoid and distract ourselves from. But it's nice to think about what we might get from the anticipatory grief. What's the value of it for us? And really the value is, I think that it can help us practice grieving in small doses, as you see in the picture there. It allows us to sort of dip our toe into the grief experience, to get some familiarity and comfort with the feelings that we might experience after a death. Um, it does help us provide clarity about what's really important to us. If we slow down and we pay attention to what we're grieving about, what losses we're encountering, it can shine a light on the things that are the most important and the most valuable to us. And it helps us to sort of shed away some of the things that we might be worrying about that actually don't need our time and attention right now. It also provides us with an ability or encouragement to express how we're feeling. It can help us have difficult conversations with the person who's dying. It allows us to say, thank you, goodbye, I love you. Um, so very different from perhaps a sudden death where we often don't get those moments of, of kind of expressing what someone means to us. Paying attention to the grief and the sorrow that we feel might prompt us to communicate in a better way. And acknowledging our own anticipatory grief with others who are involved might promote um, open communication with others in the family who might be grieving, helps us to kind of address the elephant in the room, so to speak. The other thing I want to just say about anticipatory grief is that when we try to avoid it, um, and we avoid some of the hard and heavy feelings, we end up in kind of a, a numb place, a liminal space, if you will. And what that means is, yes, we might be able to prevent ourselves from feeling the hard and the heavy, but that also deprives us from feeling moments of joy and connection. So allowing yourself to feel the sorrow and the grief also opens up the space for you to feel to feel fully the other end of the spectrum, the good things, the joyful moments. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what helps. Remembering that this is normal and natural, um, giving yourself some grace and some acceptance with what the reactions are that you're feeling, that it would be normal to feel anger and fear and worry and guilt and sadness. And that doesn't necessarily make those feelings any easier. But I think any attempt that we can make to remove the additional layers on top of these feelings that might include shame right, or a sense that we're doing this wrong, um, that's helpful. And the, the more layers we can remove, the better, because as we've acknowledged, this is really hard work. Naming our losses, as we started to do in an earlier slide, I think the more we can name what we're grieving about, the list that we can come up with that says, I, I miss these things about my mom, or I'm grieving these abilities that my husband once had, the more we can name those things, I think the more expansive we can be in our permission to give ourselves um, space to feel the impact of these losses. So I encourage you, one of the exercises we do often in grief groups and grief counseling is to create that list. What are you actually grieving about? Make the list, write it down, and give yourself permission to feel, um, to feel the impact of, of those losses. Expressing your grief. And as we said, there's a lot of barriers that, that make this difficult during a time that we're also caregiving. But I really encourage you to think about how are you mourning the losses that you're currently experiencing? How are you moving the grief reactions that you are feeling up and out? And actually crying is one of the most amazing, beautiful ways that we can do that. Um, 
it, it really does help to relieve the stress toxins that we are experiencing in our body. So I encourage you to cry if you are able to. Um, often people tell me that they go to their car to cry. That seems to be a nice safe place to do that. Um, but you don't have to cry. That's not the only way you can express your grief. You can write, you can draw, you can talk, you can talk to yourself in your car. You can talk to your person um, who is experiencing an illness. You can have a pretend conversation with them. Um, you can move your body. I like this saying that emotion needs motion, um, that often grief feels very much like an internal churn, an excess of energy. And so moving your body feels good, I think. Um, Letting it out in other ways, you know, in many other cultures, screaming and wailing um, and really uh, verbally expressing your grief is much more acceptable than it is in our culture. But um, I encourage you to trust your instincts. And if you feel the need to scream, of course, go somewhere safe. Um, but let yourself do that. Um, I remember someone sharing with me that um, that need to scream was so big um, as they were experiencing grief and they went in their backyard to scream and, and really um, made their neighbor nervous. So then discovered that they could scream um, better in the shower um, without their neighbor being worried about them. But um, finding your own way to let that out, you know, what is it? Is it writing things down and tearing up the paper? Is it crying with someone? Um, holding the grief in um, is not, not healthy uh, and thinking about ways to let it out that feel meaningful to you is very helpful. Asking for support. This is another one that's um, typically very difficult to do. Um, uh, especially in anticipatory grief when again, the focus is often on the person with an illness and less on the caregiver. So it can be very difficult to ask for help here. Um, but I encourage you to think about, you know, what do you need? What would support look like for you? If there wasn't a barrier to ask for help, what would feel helpful to you? Would it feel helpful to have someone around who, you, who could just truly listen to you? where you could vent and express without judgment? Or would it feel helpful to actually have a break from the weight of the work you're doing and the weight of the emotions that you're feeling? Sometimes a friend who can, you know, laugh with us about a silly joke or a TV show is just as helpful as the friend who can go deep and dark and listen to us as we express some of our grief. So be honest with yourself about what support would feel helpful to you. And then I really encourage you to, um, to reach out for that support. Joining a support group, talking with a counselor or therapist, reading from um, how others have coped um, can be incredibly helpful. And honestly, I think from hearing from people who are on the other side of this and wanting to be helpful, the more specific you can be to them about what you need, um, the better it feels to them. And they're very clear about what you need and how they can help you. So self-care, you know, we couldn't get through the presentation without a slide about self-care. Um, and as trite as it is to talk about, I think it's incredibly important to think about, again, what is happening to you as you experience grief, and then being um, kind to yourself to give yourself what your body needs. So the basics, water, food, rest are important. We talked about it's hard to go to sleep at night. So thinking, shifting that a little bit to say, how else can I gather rest? When my person is resting, can I let myself sit down a little bit? Um, does it feel okay to lie in my bed and not sleep, but to listen to a meditation app or you know, put on some soothing music? Maybe I can't fall asleep, but can I give myself some gentle rest uh, nonetheless? 
I want to encourage you to think about not just self-care, but self-kindness. What is your internal voice saying to you as you navigate the caregiving and you navigate the losses? Are you being kind to yourself? And a really helpful model for me in this is to think about um, what would you say to a friend who was in this situation and was saying to you, this is really hard, you know, and I, I'm experiencing grief and I'm tired and, and I'm putting out brush fires all day. Most of us would be incredibly kind and nurturing to that friend. We would, we would know what to say. We would encourage gentleness and compassion. But often the voice that we say to ourselves is very different than what we would say to a friend. So using this best friends model can be a nice way to just check in with yourself. Are you being as kind to yourself as you would be to someone else? Um, I really believe in the value of the grief reactions being a guide for us to what our body, our heart, and our brain need. So being still and paying attention to what your body is telling you it needs and then trying to give it some of that rest, quiet, stillness, uh, motion, uh, connection. What do you need right now and how can you give it to yourself in small doses? There's an assumption about anticipatory grief that I just want to mention, which is there tends to sometimes be a thought that because I have grieved in advance of the death, my grief after the death will be lessened. And the research on this is all over the map, um, surprisingly. Um, there isn't a lot of clarity about this, but practicing grief ahead of a death might help us be prepared in some ways for that for the death itself. But we want to make sure that what we don't assume is that there's one bucket of grief and we're either ladling it out bit by bit ahead of a death or we're dealing with it after the death. Anticipatory grief is a, is a solely and distinctively different experience from the grief you will encounter after a death. So you may find that you grieve ahead of the death and then you have a whole new grief experience after the death. That happens sometimes for people. Um, as much as we try to wrap our minds around what it will feel like after our person dies, there really is um, no way to fully prepare and understand what that will feel like for us. Um, and some people say, you know, the anticipatory grief that I experienced along the way actually felt harder to me than the grief I felt after the death, that it was actually more stressful for them to be in anticipatory grief holding their breath, walking on eggshells, not knowing when this end was coming, that that grief actually was harder for them than the grief they felt after the death. So I hope that the takeaway for you can be just not only to acknowledge that all of us have experienced anticipatory grief over this last year, but that um, grieving ahead of the death does not automatically impact the grief that we might feel after a death. So it's not going to be wrong if you grieve ahead of a death and then you grieve after a death as well. That would be very normal um, and expected. Before we go into um, a few minutes of questions or comments, which I'm eager to hear your thoughts, um, and, and address any questions you have. But I do want to just say that this is hard work. You know, your words, as you shared with me about um, losing yourself, losing your person bit by bit, putting out brush fires, all of these words indicate the, the level of work that you all are doing, that I am doing as we experience anticipatory grief. And I uh, you know, my heart goes out to you. I'm with you in it. 
And I just want to remind you to, you know, hold your own hearts tenderly as you experience this. Um, and I am so thankful for you all being here, um, being with me in this. It's, it's um, really helpful for me to just to hear even those brief comments that you all have shared so far to know that you are experiencing um, the same things that I am. Um, so I'm happy 